One of the favorite books of many communists is Black Shirts and Reds by Michael Parenti. Someone here on TikTok recommended that I read this book, uh, Black Shirts and Reds. Black Shirts and Reds. Black Shirts and Reds. So what I'm going to do is go from cover to cover in this book and show you how incredibly inaccurate it is. I won't be going over everything, and I will admit there are many accurate things in the book. However, it is not a credible source overall. Propagandists often use little kernels of truth to make their sources seem more legitimate. This is no different. But in this case, the entire premise of the book is wrong. The subtitle of the book is Rational Fascism and the Overthrow of Communism. So what is this rational fascism? Parenti says, fascism historically has been used to secure the interest of large capitalist interests against the demands of popular democracy. Then and now, fascism has made irrational mass appeals in order to secure the rational end of class domination. So he's using rational in a sort of economic sense, like big businesses are using fascism in order to secure their own self-interest, rationally. Parenti is hardly the first Marxian to try to make this connection between big business and fascism. Kuczynski made similar arguments back in 1964. Clements in 1972. In his own chapter of the book Fascism a Reader's Guide, Alan Millward completely tears these arguments to shreds, stating the economic tendencies of fascist states within this interpretation would be more correctly described as anti-capitalist than as capitalist, and concluding that the hypotheses which equate fascism to a stage in capitalism or to the defensive reactions of major capitalist interests are inadequate. There's just not enough evidence to support this position. Now, in the first chapter of Black Shirts and Reds, Parenti starts off by pointing out he encountered merchants who sold Mussolini shirts and talks about how he thinks people sanitize fascist history. Now, I don't know what books he's referring to here that claim that Mussolini made Italy work well, but he points out he clearly wants to focus on class policies and these books do not provide that, and how most literature doesn't talk about these social services, taxes, business, and conditions of labor. Now, this is definitely true, but things have changed more recently. His book was published in 1997. The book Hitler's Beneficiaries by German historian Gott Sally came out in 2005. This book primarily focuses on the Nazi welfare state. There's also another really new one, Hitler's True Believers. Both of these books have the common theme of looking at Nazi social policy and how they were able to keep the support of the people. In Ali's book, he says it is necessary to focus on the socialist aspect of National Socialism. Michael Parenti says taxes were increased for the general populace, but lowered or eliminated for the rich and big business. He doesn't give any sources for this. In fact, his entire book is extremely lacking in the source department, unlike Ali's book, Hitler's Beneficiaries. He points out that Nazi leadership intervened to protect lower and middle income Germans. They had tax breaks for the masses. They had the real estate inflation tax, for example, which cost German property owners 8.1 billion Reichsmarks in 1942 alone. He points out discussions of the property tax were framed by the general principle that materially better off Germans were to bear a considerably larger share of the burden of war than poor ones. Talking about their welfare state, he says upward mobility for the common people in various forms and not infrequently at the cost of others was one of the fundamental political innovations of the 20th century. The Nazi brand of socialism was part of this tradition. Now, I should clarify, I'm not a welfare state supporter. I don't support any of these prescriptions. This is merely an objective analysis of history using credible sources. The national socialist economy was not a good thing, and we should not seek to be like it. Some great sources showing how terrible it was is Omnipotent Government by Ludwig von Mises and The Wages of Destruction by Adam Tooze. You can also check out this paper if you want something shorter. Going back to Parenti, he also says both states guaranteed a return on the capital invested by giant corporations while assuming most of the risk and losses on investments. He gives no sources for this. The Vampire Economy was written by a Marxist economist who lived in Germany during this period. In this book, he quotes a letter from a businessman saying, We businessmen still make sufficient profit, sometimes even large profits, but we never know how much we are going to be able to keep. And again, we see the rising of taxes. So the state did help secure a return on capital. They even had state loans to help businessmen. However, this was only done to bring about the interest of the state itself, not the interest of the businessmen. The historian Jackson Spielvogel pointed out state constraints on exchange, imports, exports, prices, wages, the allocation of labor. Profits were limited and directed by the government. When businesses refused to work with the government on a project that would be unprofitable, the government moved in and established its own factories. Ludwig von Mises makes very similar observations in Planned Chaos. The government tells these seeming entrepreneurs what and how to produce, at what prices and from whom to buy, at what prices and from whom to sell. 
The government decrees what wages laborers should work and whom and under what terms the capitalists should entrust their funds. Market exchange is but a sham. Every aspect of the economy was fixed by the state. The historian Ian Kershaw points out that the state, not the market, would determine the shape of economic development. He points out that the liberal ideas of economic competition were replaced. However, he also tries to say Hitler was never a socialist and capitalism was left in its place. This is just wrong. He's using socialists interchangeably with Marxists, and he's not using any correct definition of capitalism. His actual observations about what is happening is correct. He's a good historian, but he's not very good on economics because he's a historian. It can't be said that Parenti is a good historian or good at economics. He says that most writers have ignored fascism's close collaboration with big business. He points to a Hoover Institute conservative who said, if fascism means anything, it means government ownership and control of business. But Parenti says, if fascism means anything, it means all-out government support for business. All of the historians I've gone over so far agree with the conservative, even the ones who aren't conservative and agree with Parenti on a few points, like Ian Kershaw, who says Hitler wasn't a socialist. Now, are Parenti's claims about big business correct? He also says the SA was subsidized by business, but he doesn't give any sources for this, and tries to argue that the National Socialists got a majority of their funds from business. He's wrong on all of these points. Now, it's kind of funny that Parenti brings up the SA, as Timothy S. Brown points out. The SA in this period he's talking about was at least one-third of former communists. The SA's own records shows 55%, a majority, were former communists. Now, as for his claim that big business was behind the rise of national socialism and fascism, this just isn't true. This was debunked 12 years before his book was published by historian Henry Ashby Turner, pointing out that people who hold this view don't really rely on evidence. He actually tears them to shreds in this book. It's quite fantastic. Most importantly, he says, those firms and organizations that regularly engaged in large-scale political funding continued right down to the last election prior to Hitler's appointment as chancellor to bestow the bulk of their funds on opponents or rivals of the Nazis. There was a few businessmen who did support the National Socialists, but they were very few and far between. And the very few who did support them did it because they thought the same thing as Michael Parenti that it was rational fascism, and not actually national socialism. And it's quite fitting that some of these terrible guys who were behind this ended up in concentration camps with their businesses stolen from them. Yeah, serves you right for supporting the national socialists. One great example is Fritz Thyssen. Richard J. Evans talks about him in The Third Reich in Power. Thyssen bitterly condemned the state's direction with the economy and prophesied that the Nazis would soon start shooting industrialists who did not fulfill the conditions prescribed by the four-year plan just as their equivalents were shot in Soviet Russia. Now, if they were serving his interest, then why would he think they would act like Soviet Russia? Hmm. And if they were serving his interest, why would they lock him up in a concentration camp and nationalize his business? That doesn't make a lot of sense. And it's also worth noting that the same author in his earlier book, The Coming of the Third Reich, points out that the Nazi party was not dependent on big business or bureaucratic institutions such as trade unions for its financial support. Richard J. Evans is a well-renowned historian of the Third Reich, and unfortunately he also says Hitler wasn't a socialist. But it's because, again, he defines socialism as just Marxism. A good historian, not a good economist. Okay, well now you might point out that he's talking about Italy and Germany, and I've really only gone over Germany so far. So let's briefly touch up on Italy. A. James Greger is the leading historian on Italian fascism. He points out that the Italian business community in general welcomed the disappearance of fascism. Fascism never served the interests of Italian business. Another historian, Franklin Hugh Adler, in his book on Italian industrialists, says under fascism the state had more latitude for control over the economy than any other nation at the time except for the Soviet Union. That clearly contradicts Parenti's claim that they privatized state-owned industries. They actually socialized 80 enterprises. In Germany, they didn't really privatize either. They had a policy of Gleichschaltung. As I pointed out, this was more state control over the businesses, not less. The National Socialists actually abolished the right to private property. As Parenti repeatedly talks about Mussolini and Hitler crushing organized labor. That's not really true. Rather than crushing organized labor, these regimes nationalized it. The National Socialists had the DAF, which acted to improve worker interests. It was one of the largest labor unions in history. Nationalizing unions and the restrictions on striking wasn't far off from Marxist socialist regimes like the Soviet Union or like Cuba. Now, Parenti also gets into Americans that support the National Socialists, which certainly is true, but neglects to say many supported the Bolsheviks as well. He says some capitalists supported the Nazi war effort, but neglects to point out his precious Soviet Union did the same thing for them. That's it for part one. Sorry for the TikTok audience. I know this is a long video. Part two coming soon.